afternoon. This is Julia Witta with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today Malachi Stewart, who is going to be talking to us about his book. Um, and I've forgotten the title, Malachi. It's um, called Journey to Malachi. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your book. Sure. Um, Journey to Malachi is it's a biographical um, portrait, um, uh, really the inside um, details of like what sexual, how sexual abuse um, affects people generally. Um, it, it's the story of, of my life and just how I dealt with sexual abuse as a young child um, and the confusion it caused. Um, sexually, of course, because you know you have a lot of different elements you deal with, like sex, same-sex attraction, especially being a male with a um, same-sex abuser, and just all of the emotional and just physical effects that it had on my life. Um, and then just, you know, I, I, was, I, mean, I was a Christian, being an active Christian Christian and dealing with, you know, confusion, sexual confusion, and just how the um, the church didn't really know how to respond to that. And so I just really take people through my life and throughout the book and just through all the hard times and through all the good times. But it's a very honest look, um, because I think a lot of times people or I have found um, that when people write about the subject, they kind of write in a way that's kind of general and they kind of, you know, gloss over the actual feelings, you know, that the person had or what it really feels like to go through those things or how hard it is or what kind of thought processes are going through from a child. You know, I start off the book and I'm about six. And so, you know, I'm leaving off as an adult and just the different things that I had to go through the phases in life, the, even the after effects, um, in my personality, like, you know, being extremely rebellious and and um, having problems with authority, things calls from, you know, j just being abused. And I think a lot of times people uh, feel like it's a weakness to say that something happened to me and it calls me to to not be OK. And so I just wanted to to kind of not just show the downside or kind of dwell on the negativity, but kind of lead people on my journey um, because it, it ended well. My journey ended with healing and with wholeness. And I wanted to give people hope that even something that starts off very negative and something that starts off very dark and very perilous, it can end, you know, in hope and it can end with, with, with joy because not only am I, am I going through the book, um, finding myself, you know, journeying to myself, but I'm asking questions along the way, like, you know, well, who is God and, and why did he allow this to happen to me? And dealing with the, the realities of growing up um, in church and seeing people, you know, talk about all these wonderful things that God had did, had done for them, or even seeing people, um, I, I grew up in a more charismatic church movement. So people were, you know, um, more accepting of the prophetic movement and praying and people were sharing things that, that God had given them insight into other people's lives. And so I felt really invisible. Like nobody ever saw me and nobody ever reached out to me. And so I just I just deal with all of that. And even I guess lastly, even um, the parental dynamics, you know, between I grew up in a single parent household. And so I, I, I wanted to also kind of write this so that parents would have a warning, you know, and something to take heed for as to what happens when a child is not covered. The, or when one, not the warning a lot signs to watch for. Right. Because a lot of parents like my mom grew up. Um, she grew up extremely impoverished um, and she grew up from a broken family. And, you know, there was no no level of normalcy. And so she thought that her, she was that the she was a good parent if she provided for me. And there was always provision, even when we didn't have a lot. There was I've, I've never not had, you know, the light bill working or never not had gas, never mm -hmm. sat in the cold. I never, so my mom provided for me. She always worked and she always did what she had to do. But because of that, I was always, I was alone a lot and I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't covered and she didn't see some of the signs that were very obvious because she was working. And yeah. so it was so shocking to her to find out that this whole time something still, even though you did your best, something still happened. And, mm -hmm. and it wasn't something that I think um, parents can prevent, but I just wanted them to see, like, it, the, the warning signs and to see that it's it, it's more than just working and providing the physical needs of your child. It's important to pay attention to them and to ask questions like, why does a child go from being happy to, you know, all of a sudden the, these these drastic personality changes? So I just wanted parents to be aware of it because it doesn't just affect 
a childhood and, and children don't forget what happened to them. It, it, it does affect you long term. It does change who you are as a person. And something dies when your innocence is taken away. And so I wanted them to, to know that. And, and I wanted the children who had lost something to know that there is purpose that you can find from the pain. That there, it doesn't have to just be like this happened to me and I spent the rest of my life in prison. So, so that's why I wrote the book. And that's what the book is really about. Hmm. And did you go into counseling or how do you tell them what, what they can do if they're dealing with it right now? Absolutely. I, I am definitely an avid supporter of counseling. Even my counseling was, um, for the most part, was um, Christian counseling. Mm -hmm. So it was more religious and spiritual. I definitely, though, want to say I support both. I think that if you were to ask me, I would support going to receiving religious counseling as well as um more more um, natural counseling, counseling outside of um, religion. I, I think both. I think therapy is completely instrumental. Um, I have done some therapy outside of religious settings, um, but I, I actually plan to do more. I, I think that the the issue is so deep and it's so vast. I don't think that even in even after recovery, and I don't consider myself a survivor. I definitely consider myself an overcomer. But even even as an overcomer, I think there are still issues, there's still things that I, that you always need to deal with, and just keep the conversation open. What what helps us heal is talking about it. So mm -hmm. even if you are even if you are you know um, at a stage where you feel really unhealthy, you the more you talk about, the more you express, the more you dig deep and, and release those emotions, the the better you are. And I don't think that that's a process that that ends. I think that the everyone needs to understand it's not a like a certain level you attain to and then you reach that point. It's progressive and perpetual. And so that's the gift that we have. It's a perpetual healing and yeah, so I definitely support therapy, and and that's I do mention that in the book. I mean, definitely, um, I, I, I'm a Christian, so I definitely believe in, in you know Christian therapy as well as um, more. I talk about kind of deliverance and what that looks like in the book from a Christian perspective, but I don't. I think that even that is not all. It's not one dimensional. And I think that's another thing in, in the church. I had a lot of issues because when I was going to Christian, and I addressed this actually in the book, um, I would go to my pastors and they were not able to counsel me because they would give me like, you know, a scripture or a quick prayer. But I was a person. Mm -hmm. And so you... You that doesn't change what happened to me. It doesn't change how I feel about myself. It doesn't change how I feel about others. It doesn't change um, fears and confusion. It doesn't address any of those things. But definitely talking about it helps. Why? Because this is an issue that has been silenced. And what happens when a person is a child, especially victims of um, CSA, childhood sexual abuse, when you're a child, you are taught that secrets are things that you, you keep a secret because you're ashamed of something. And so this is something that I had to keep a secret. I associate this with shame and guilt and condemnation. And those are recipes for an unhealthy lifestyle. And so when I'm speaking on it, every time I talk about it, I'm I'm breaking free from the silence and breaking free from the shame. And I remember the first time I had to speak on it, I was like, my head was down and I was so ashamed to say what happened to me. You know, you flash forward to now. Uh, maybe like four or five years later after I first spoke on my abuse and I can talk about it freely they're, they're, the shackles break and you know because of, mm -hmm. of being able to release your voice so I definitely support therapy and I definitely not only support therapy I encourage every victim if, if in any way you can help another person whether it's just a little blog that maybe four or five people read if it's just you reaching out to people you know who've been through what you have been through helping other people is definitely therapeutic as well so Yes, and I'm sure absolutely. there must be online communities, maybe, or, or do you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, for for male survivors, one of the um, the best um, online communities I have seen for male survivors is uh, malesurvivors.org. Mm -hmm. They are extremely phenomenal. There is a ton of male survivors on there. The first thing you will feel is not alone. <laughs> um, they have active chats. They have active chats, um, so you can maintain anonymity. Um, they have a lot of forums. There's so much information. Um, also, I'm a um, part of Rain. Um, I'm a, a part of the Speakers Bureau for Rain, um, is which is an organization. It's an organization for um, survivors of rape, incest, molestation, and all types of abuse. Um, and the acronym is R A I I N. 
I think I got that right. Um, and hopefully, do they have but a you, you can definitely. They do have a website. Um, it's Rain dot org, and they are phenomenal as well. And they can they'll put you into contact with any of the um any resources that you might need. Um. For your for what you have gone through specifically, they have a hotline as well, um, and I don't know the 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 number to the hotline offhand, but it's definitely um, something that you can Google um, because it's, it's Rain is one of the most popular, and they're based in D.C. and they do an awesome job. Um, this is this is a place where people who want to hold. Um, People who want to hold events for sexual abuse or want to kind of reach out to the community, this is who you would talk to. So even as in Philadelphia, if somebody is wanting or the media wants to talk about the issue, Rain contacts victims like or survivors like myself, and we are able to share our story. So I think that's definitely an awesome um tool and goal. Also, um, there's a ministry called Exodus, Exodus International, and they do a phenomenal job um, giving Christian counseling. So if you look at Exodus International, they will tell you in your area all of the um, Christian locations you can get help from. Also, if you are struggling with same-sex attraction, which I want to be clear about, it's not the same thing as saying that you know um, you have chosen a lifestyle. Of homosexuality, people who are struggling with same-sex attraction are people who don't necessarily feel like they're that's who they are. They just, you know, neurologically, if your first experience sexually was with the yeah. same sex, then muscle memory, everything remembers that, and so they, these are people who don't feel like they, they feel like their identity hasn't been one they've chosen, but one that was more put on them. And so, Access International does an awesome job. Um, also in Philadelphia, there's an, another place called um, Harvest USA. Their website, I believe, is harvestusa.org, and they do an awesome job. So there are a lot of resources out there, um, more resources out there than than were out there when I, I think I was um, going through my, my own transitional period. And so I definitely encourage people to take advantage of it because it's an awesome, it's an awesome, it's awesome to feel like there's a lot of support behind you and a lot of people to, you know, help you out. Also, I wanted to say that melsurvivor.org is geared towards males. But there's a lot of support on their site for for non males for for females as well, um, and so you you can't join the site if you aren't a male because they have a lot of male only male specifically um, you know geared information. But they definitely have resources that are not just for males. So I, I don't want to throw that out there. <laughs> and that they also have um, a list of therapists as well, trusted therapists. So there's so much information out there. And I want to say this, too. I don't want to um, kind of take too much uh, time on this, but it's really important if you're going to do therapy to find a therapist or to find um, a psychologist that is going to that, that specializes in this particular field. Mm -hmm. So whether you need help with the after effects of a molestation, incest, rape, same sex attraction you need to find someone. You wouldn't go to a lawyer who does real estate and ask them to help you out with your family law. You would go to a lawyer who specializes in that. You know, you would, you you don't get divorced and ask a corporate attorney, can they help? Can they go over <laughs> the paperwork? You want people who specialize. And so for this, you want people who specialize in it. If you're a male, you want people who even specialize on male survivors and same sex. You want, you, you know, whatever it is, if you're a female, same, because you don't want to... Therapy, if, if not taken you know properly if, if the proper research isn't put into it it can be detrimental you don't mm -hmm. want to sit and have someone who doesn't understand you across from you because it's very very hard and i know that firsthand so i, I definitely wanted to say that while we were on the subject yeah i know that too do do you cover this in your uh, guest blog at uh, tv backstory the guest blog that you did um, for us at, at tv at the guest in the guest block, I don't think I cover um, therapy as much. Um, I think in the guest block, I just kind of um, give an overview of where I was, where, I, where I've come from, and, and my relation to the subject, um, and why I wrote the book. But I do talk, I do have resources actually on my blog site, um, sanctumsanctorum.com, and the link to that is, um, I think, connected to the blog, so to the blog post. So there okay. definitely is, you know a way to find that information. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also a lot of on Facebook and on Twitter. I'm always tweeting out resources because I want people to get help, definitely. So so I would encourage people to go to tvbackstory.com and read Malachi's um, blog where he um, 
gives more of this information. And where's your book available, Malachi? Currently, my book is available um, on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. as well as barnesandnoble.com. So that's where I'm at right now. And I'm a new author, my a first time author. So I'm, you know, starting to meet with bookstores. I actually have mm -hmm. a meeting today with some local bookstores. So we'll see if we can get um, Journey to Malachi in more places. Um, but for now, you definitely can order off Amazon and barnesandnoble.com, which I'm, I'm excited about because they're very really safe places, you know, to order from. And so did definitely. You, how um, long did it take copy. you to write this book? Well, interesting. I, I want to say it took me a year to write it, but in truth, I wrote the first part. Uh, I wrote the first part in probably less than a month. I just sat and wrote, and I didn't write again for like maybe three or four months. I just left a lot, totally abandoned the story because, you know, you don't feel like you have anything valuable to say. You don't, I, I didn't feel like I had anything, um, I had anything interesting or anything. I, I haven't gone to. I, I'm a religion. I'm a religion major. I haven't gone to school for, um, you know, anything related to psychology or anything. So I thought, like, you know, I, there are a lot of people out there talking, and you know, everybody's fine. But I think when I was on, um, on campus at Drexel University, and I was doing ministry, and I was realizing how many people were affected by their abuse and then I would just find myself always talking about it with people and always online and the benefit one thing about me is I'm, I'm really open I don't I'm ready I don't hide parts of it I don't keep parts to myself I'm re I'm really w willing to put all of my business on front street to be very transparent so that people can be healed and so I was having the same conversations with people over and over and constantly like telling my whole story so that other people could be free or or at least have hope at the readiness. Yeah, right. Um and so I said, well that's what I have to offer. You know, other people may understand more um of the didactic, you know, reasonings behind why we go through what we go through, why we feel what we feel. But I can at least say that I felt that I can at least give you a real insight. This is not, you know, a textbook. This is a person telling you I've been there. This is my struggles. This is what my low points really look like. There were real low points and there were real high points. And this is what it looks like when you when you self you become self-destructive because you don't love yourself, because you don't have a self-esteem, because you don't you don't know who you are. This is what it really looks like. And I wanted people to read and to be able to see themselves. I, I literally wrote when I was writing, I thought about who I was and I said, I'm going to write everything that I needed to hear, everything that I needed <laughs> a person good. to say to me. So that's what I really talk about in the blog post, too. That's why you should go to to the talk TV and look at the blog because I talk about that. I wrote for this little boy. And not just for him. And when I was finished, I realized that his story was universal. I began to let other people read the book. And I went back and I would write long parts of it, um, just sitting there at night in my dorm room, just writing. And I would let other people read parts and they would say, wow, like that's my story. And I'm like, well, you're not, I mean, females are reading it. People who, who had not, who had not even been abused and who had grown up in what I thought was great childhoods. Um, you know, they yeah. grew up financially stable and everybody was happy, you know, mm -hmm. more like a, you know, a huxtable situation. And, mm -hmm. and so they were saying, no, but this is my story. And so I started to find as I was letting people kind of test read that it was a universal story because I mean, people may not be able to identify with abuse. They may not be able to identify with, um, sexual confusion, but they can identify with pain. They can identify with suffering. We all can identify with hopelessness. We all can identify um, with with fear. <laughs> and 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 so it, it became it became something universal. And so no matter you know who you are, what it offers is hope. It does offer light. It does we all have something that we're ashamed of. We all have something that we feel guilty about. We all have something some type of convictions that we don't meet up to that cause us to feel condemned. And a lot of us do have questions about God because, I mean, I grew up so religious. I grew up with so many ideas about this loving, kind, awesome God. And then my experiences were not a reflection of that. Yeah. So what do you do then? How does God feel about me if this happened? And so those are real questions that we all have at, at some point, no matter what the religion, no matter what that is. And so I address those and I, and I'm going to be real about even being a minister, I'm going to be real about, no, this wasn't, oh, and, and I did leave the book with a different perception. You have to kind of read it, but it's okay. it's not um, it's not something you've heard before. It's not something recycled. This is definitely a, a fresh look and a um, fresh insight. So so definitely that's, that's and, what you um, I hope you'll, you're going to be at the <clears throat> chat room when we do the broadcast. So if people have questions, they can ask you. 
personally. I will certainly, I will certainly make myself available for that. Um, okay. I, I enjoy talking to people because that's, that's the whole point of it. I mean, the book was really birthed from, um, you know, interactions with other people. If, if I, if not, if I'm not talking to other people, I'm not doing my job. So definitely <laughs> I'm going to make myself available for any questions. Okay. Well, thank you for being on the show this afternoon, and <clears throat> any I'm looking forward to talking with you in the chat room and seeing your blog on tvbackstory.com and uh, checking out your website. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Okay.